I'm not gonna lie, I have been one of the more vocal critics of the Guild Wars 2 franchise despite my love for the game. Ultimately, the criticism is spawned from a place of love, disagreeing with balanced decisions or content directions, not from a perspective of selfishness, but more from an overall target market point of view. I want the game to sell well. It has taken almost a year and a half, but I think I've finally figured out what these so-called mini expansions actually are. And after I learned this, it helped me to appreciate and accept the game for what it is, and maybe it'll help you as well. Let's talk about ArenaNet's expansion model. First, some context. ArenaNet has had an interesting way of titling things since the launch of the game. You see this with dungeons being replaced by fractals, raids being rebranded as strikes only to be reintroduced as raids, and then dragon response missions. Oh yeah, don't think I forgot about the nearly year-long window that DRMs were the primary content releases. It was a thing. Not only that, but they have reinvented their content release cadence and monetization strategies regarding this game, going from living world seasons, which were just new stories and existing maps and assets, to full-blown expansions with four new maps, elite specializations, armors, legendaries, and so on. The living world seasons that were expected to be the live updates in between the box expansions and these living world season introduced an entirely new map with each update often a new legendary weapon armor skins the works and these were free if you were an active player now the monetization strategy of the traditional living world season was remarkably stupid you could have easily incorporated a 20 or 30 dollar fee between expansions to unlock the living world content Realistically, the vast majority of ArenaNet's quarterly revenue is cash shop, which is not a new concept. It's all, it's all microtransactions, and it's the standard for most live service games. And keeping players engaged with new things to do and keeping them logging in every day, it gives them more opportunities to swipe that credit card. And this is where the problem lies. I have largely held off on criticizing the expansion model as a whole. I have mentioned that I dislike it, and I wanted to wait until the entirety of Janthier Wilds was released to compare Secrets of the Obscure to it and see where we as players stand, because frankly you could not compare Soto to the previous expansions Heart of Thorns, Path of Fire, or End of Dragons, and realistically if you take new weapons or elite specializations out of the equation, you can't really compare Secrets of the Obscure to Living World Season 3 or Season 4. And we will get back to Janthier since it is following basically an upgraded version of the Soto model. But let's take a look at Season 3 and Season 4 of Living World and what we got compared to what we got in Soto and what is proposed in Janthier Wilds. In Season 3 of Living World, we had the release of six open world maps, two raid wings, and three fractals alongside five stories according to the wiki. Maps are more or less evergreen with Bloodstone Fen, Ember Bay, Bitterfrost Frontier, Lake Doric, Draconis Mons, and Siren's Landing. These were released on a similar release cadence with the initial release being in July of 2016 and then the final release being in July of 2017. So that's important. So you got six maps across the year along with all these little extras thrown in, right? Season four was equally juicy with three raid wings, roller beetle racing being added, two mounts plus six zones, most notably being Dragonfall and Domain of Istan, along with three fractals. And this was released in a similar timeline. Both of these seasons saw the addition of ascended gear and trinkets. Season four had the addition of volatile magic, which streamlined the crafting process a lot. And all of that content was free if you were playing the game. And granted the raids and fractals were kind of added as parts of both the expansion and the living world in general they weren't exactly paywalled but they kind of were but the new expansions are better than the content releases of yesteryear right if you look at the most disastrous of the live service releases which was the ice brood saga you see a more accurate comparison to the current model ice brood saga had three maps with bajor marches drizzlewood coast and those two being split in half between releases additionally they released with the 
SRMs, which were largely a giant turd, but they had seven strike missions, which is the Ice Brood Saga Fast Five, Cold War, and Forging Steel. The last thing I'll say about the Ice Brood Saga era that cannot be understated was that ArenaNet was basically on the verge of collapse. Uh, it was after big layoffs hit and CSoft was up their ass and COVID happened, which led to some of the more lackluster releases during this period. However, for the most part, they implemented some of the most replayable content that exists currently in Guild Wars 2 during this period. So now, finally, let's talk about the new expansions. Secrets of the Obscure, the first of the mini X-Packs, right? Three maps, with the third map being split into thirds, two strike missions, one fractal, weapon master training, and the reintroduction of the existing amount, the sky scale, with a revamp to daily login reward systems known as the Wizard's Vault. And the Wizard's Vault is the key that gave this whole thing away, so keep the Wizard's Vault in mind. They introduced open world legendary armor, which was applicable to the larger player base, introduced a relic system, which reworked the existing rune system and added a scalable way to introduce new effects without having to compete with the traditional rune system without also power scaling everything. And for the most part, Secrets of the Obscure expansion, if that's what you want to call it, was a restructuring more than anything for veteran players. The new weapons weren't exactly the greatest, but the weapon mastery was very impactful to the game overall. And now finally, we are here at Janther Wilds with the first quarterly update on the books. We have seen two maps, a world boss, a raid, and a convergence alongside the first of two proposed legendaries. You've got spears on land, you got player housing, and with the expected release of two new maps and the subsequent updates along with a fractal, it's safe to say that if you aren't really into what is released currently, there's really nothing else for you to look forward to. Meaning if the raid or the convergence isn't your speed, you likely aren't going to engage with the challenge mode or the LCM. And if you don't engage with homesteads, you likely aren't going to engage with the new homestead decorations, which is unfortunate. However, it's okay because Soto and Janthier Wilds are not expansions, nor should their value be compared to the expansions of the past because they aren't expansions. And I know what you're going to say, oh, still, if they aren't expansions, then what are they, huh? Well, here's the secret. They're battle passes. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. It is the most cleverly disguised battle pass known to modern gaming. This is made blatantly clear by what items are actually locked out of the Wizard's Vault in the event you chose not to purchase the latest expansion. Not only are cosmetic items like skins and stuff locked behind purchases of this battle pass, but legendary starter kits and so on. And a lot of these items, they don't end up in the eternal Wizard's Vault section. So it incentivizes playthrough of the seasons as the actual content gets released which is a battle pass. And to be honest, after I realized this, it did change my perspective on the game. Now that we are moving into this one year seasonal cycle of paying for this living world battle pass, it helped me realize how to play Guild Wars 2 all along, which is casually. The 90 day Wizards Vault refreshes are easily accomplished through the various special and weekly vault rewards. The legendary spear that was released is heavily time gated and can be completed well before the next Wizards Vault's refresh. And even with the next release being 90 days out, I am not all that interested in the challenge modes of the various convergences or raids. By playing this game casually and accepting that the entire Guild Wars 2 mini expansions are simply a battle pass helps me determine that this game is a game that I can comfortably play as a secondary or a tertiary game well into the future. Future. And if ArenaNet is smart, they will continue this cadence for as long as possible. Since frankly, the content quality is not even close to what we were delivered in the past, I firmly believe that this cadence can be upkept even if a Guild Wars 3 is released or a AAA multi-platform game gets added to ArenaNet's gaming catalog. The only real hang up that I have is that it isn't an expansion and it really shouldn't be considered one. Having the last two releases in the same category category as Heart of Thorns, Path of Fire, or End of Dragons does nothing but muddy expectations.
expectations of the consumer. And with that, I want to thank you for watching. A big thanks to all of my subscribers. A special thanks to all of my members, Gary, Dr. Cookie Dippins, Mitch, Teronius. If you want to become a member and support the channel, there is a link in the description. Additionally, I'm working through Lies of P on Saturday mornings from 6 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. PST. So consider dropping by if you want to see me get wrecked. Anyways, thanks again, and I will catch you on the next one. Peace.